Okay, great. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Aura. I am council member Janice Lewis George's um, community engagement director and organizing director uh, for the Ward 4 council office. Um, I have been the one hosting these um, Green New Deal trainings um, to make sure that folks are um, being brought into the process of, of how council passes laws and then in particular how we can um, leverage you know, resident input um, and action around um, getting the Green New Deal for social housing passed um, um, this, this term. So um, with that, uh, what we have in store today is basically a um, quick presentation I'm pulling up now. I'm not going to make it full screen because then I can't see the chat, um, so I apologize. Hopefully it's still big enough for y'all to see. Um, um, but essentially what we have in store today is just a quick training on what the Green New Deal for social housing bill does, the bill itself as it's written, um, and then discuss a bit about um, just how like testimony can be written effectively um, and convincingly. And then uh, I'm happy to talk a bit about public speaking as well for those of you uh, who maybe don't love it, like I myself don't love it, um, but have had to work on it for a few years now. Um, so uh, the goal since these are small groups uh, which is my favorite kind of training is for y'all to be able to also ask any detailed question uh, whether simple whether big and so um we'll definitely you know be able to go on on our own pace so um we're going to start with some um grounding i'm actually going to skip this this task just because there's a small group um but we'll talk a little bit about what it is shortly um, and then I'll go into an overview of DC Council legislation, the Green New Deal itself, um, and uh, talk about testimony. And I see a question in the chat already. Can we get a copy of the presentation? Absolutely. Uh, you will get a copy um, as well as a couple of helpful links for um, uh, as you write your testimony. So definitely we'll go out um, as soon as the presentation is done uh, or the meeting is done today. Um, Okay, cool. So some quick house rules, um, just so that we can have a, you know, effective and interactive session. Um, the first uh, thing is, um, let me know if you're trying to say something, you know, feel free to raise a digital hand, a real hand, um, or drop a star or a stack in the chat, literally just typing the word stack. That just lets me know that you have a question or a comment or that you want to speak. Um, and again, I'm tracking the chat. So feel free to interact that way. Um, since again, it's also a small group, feel free to also just unmute and interrupt me and just let me know that you have a question. Um, okay, in terms of plus 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 in the chat, if you resonate, this is just a way of us knowing that we're engaging with what others are saying in the call. And so if you, you know, hear something that you're excited about, here's something that you agree with or that you resonate with, just definitely, exactly, thank you a lot, drop some, some love in the chat. Um, Next thing, and I always say this because I spent a lot of time in academia and in school, um, it's participation is helpful, but it's definitely not required. If you're here and you're also watching Gilmore Girls on the other screen, totally chill, no hate, you know, be present in whatever ways that means for you. And again, I will be sharing the, the presentation with you all at the end, so you can always do your homework later. Um, and then lastly, no question is too simple. No question is a bad question. This is a space for y'all to, to get whatever you need from it. So just please, um, again, just let me know what um, what you need. Okay. All right. So, um, like I said, we're going to start with just a quick overview of, of a, what a bill is in DC lingo and then what the council does um, so that uh, we can all make sure that we're on the same very basic stage. Um, so the first thing I'll mention is uh, a bill in DC is essentially just a proposal for a law or a legislative change. Um, and so when a bill is introduced, it goes through several stages. If you want to learn all about the ins and outs of this, I have a different training, but for all the purposes you need to know today is that when a bill is introduced, it is referred to a committee within the DC Council. Um, so the DC Council is the legislative branch of DC's government, and so uh, they are um, organized into committees that specialize on particular topics, particular issues, particular agencies um, that impact uh, uh, the DC community. And so when a bill is introduced, it is referred to a committee that then has a, a number of stages or things that it has to do um, before a bill gets to basically move forward, get voted on and get it passed into law. And so the stage at where we are, we are we, ugh, the stage at which we are in right now is the committee stage within the Committee of Housing and Executive Administration. Uh, that's where the Green New Deal for Social Housing Bill is uh, was referred to. Um, and so uh, we are currently at the public hearing stage, which essentially means that we are going to have space for the public and for experts, you know, all of you to come together and testify 
um, as to why you think this is a great bill and, you know, what we can see, what we can hope to see going forward with the bill, any changes and, and the like. Um, I'll just note two quick things about committees is that uh, at, at the committee stage, there's also a process called markup, which is essentially, uh, you can think about it, it's taking a red pen to a draft legislation um, and changing some wording, changing some lines, removing, adding anything of that nature. Um, usually the markup happens after a public hearing because what the uh, committee gets to do is hear from all of you um, and hear from you know anyone else who signs up to testify as to what they like about the bill, what they don't like about the bill, what they wanna see improved in the bill. Um, and they get to make those changes based on all of that community input. So really um, you know, awesome that we have a public hearing and have this opportunity to, to voice again on specific line items of the bill that we're excited by. Um, and lastly, the committee votes to move the bill forward. And so um, you'll see that you know, coming into the next legislative session is when the committee decides to say, yes, we're happy with what we have right now. We're going to vote on it and we're going to move it forward. Okay. Um, okay, great. Um, just a quick fact is um, if a bill dies at any point, meaning if people vote no against it or if the clock runs out before the bill can be passed within a legislative session, um, it can always be reintroduced um, come next legislative session. And so um, in cases where we see that, you know, again, like time runs out or the bill just doesn't get passed this time, like we saw with rent control about a year back, um, there's always an opportunity for a, a council member to reintroduce that bill come the next session. Okay. So I already touched on these things of what is a public hearing. It's an opportunity for the public and experts to weigh in on the legislation. Um, and then a, a beautiful um, aspect of it is that hearing record is the, the basically this, a stack of testimony, you know, your, your direct copies, your transcripts, whatever it may be that gets to be used for that markup process that I explained earlier. And so um, the hearing, the official hearing record is essentially what's used to then um, mark up the bill. And so um, for folks who may not be able to testify on November 22nd, the day of the hearing itself, you're still always able to submit a written testimony and written testimony can be submitted at two, I think up to two days after the hearing. And so we have, you know, a few days to make sure that folks are still in that hearing record, even if you weren't able to give oral testimony. Um, great. And then just to note uh, how to participate in a hearing, I will um, just note that for this um, particular hearing, all you have to e do is email um, housing at dccouncil.us um, and let them know your your name and phone number and if you're with an organization let them know that affiliation as well if, if you want to testify um, the day of again that's November 22nd at 11 a.m um, and if you just want to submit your testimony you just email it directly to that address as well if you just want to submit written testimony okay and this is just what a public hearing notice looks like. And that has all that information that I just mentioned. Okay, cool. And talk about the Green New Deal. Um, so really exciting to uh, finally have a Green New Deal introduced here in DC. Um, prior to joining Council Member Lewis George's team, I was a climate justice organizer really pushing for a Green New Deal at local and uh, national levels. And so um, it's really exciting to see when your own have introduced a, a, a bill to this end. So um, the Green New Deal, if you're not familiar, it's essentially a big framework or a package um, of economic and intersectional transformation. And so it really came from the fact that we had to uh, reckon with the fact that the climate crisis has gotten to where it's already gotten and that we need to do a massive transformation of our economy and of our kind of societal approach to things um, to move away from fossil fuels and other, you know, climate harming tendencies and practices that we have. And so the Green New Deal obviously borrows from the New Deal, FDR's New Deal, um, in being an economic uh, plan and economic vision for injecting the economy with um, good, clean jobs. Um, and helping us uh, tackle the climate crisis in that direction. So um, as, in, uh, as envisioned, the Green New Deal is not a single bill, um, but a plan um, and a vision that can be implemented. And so something that we've seen all across the country already is Green New Deal solutions being presented to a number of um, public and social uh, justice issues. And so we've seen Green New Deals for public schools introduced. We've seen Green New Deals for transportation, for public housing, and so much more. And so uh, the Green New Deal for social housing bill that was introduced in DC Council gets to just join 
um, this other awesome set of legislation that's out there working to tackle again on these different public and social uh, justice issues. So um, kind of going back to everything, um, you might be thinking, okay, well, why would we use this framework in particular to address the housing crisis in DC? Um, and so in many ways, the answer is that the climate crisis affects everything. We're already seeing the effects of it in DC. And so I will be, you know, showing some examples of that, but I'll also talk about the fact that the, um, the Green New Deal really allows us to just make sure that we're tackling a lot of the issues that we have at the same time through that intersectional um, um, lens and framework. So these are some examples um, that I just pulled of things that happened uh, in August, a couple of months ago, um, where we saw a lot of floodings. This is uh, in Ward 4, the ward that I work. This is in Ward 5, um, and this is just up in Greenbelt uh, Station in Maryland. And so we saw uh, DC's current infrastructure be extremely, extremely overwhelmed and inadequate for handling the effects of the climate crisis that are already here. I know, um, I think someone mentioned the sun in my background. I'm not in DC right now. Um, and so that's why it's here, but I know that DC had the, like a wild, wild um, week in terms of weather. And so again, these are just basic um, examples, but very prevalent examples of how the climate crisis is already here, is already affecting DC. Um, and if you want to talk more about climate justice in DC, I'm happy to, you know, shout out some names later of people who are doing awesome work here um, um, to address what we're already seeing and the lack of, of readiness and preparedness that we have. Okay. So the little um, grounding exercise that I had given earlier was what are the three main issues impacting DC residents. Um, the reason I skipped it is because it doesn't always work out, um, but I did try to grab some words that have popped up from um, prior trainings. And so we see that in DC, we have a number of issues that are affecting folks, but housing, housing conditions and affordable housing comes up um, time and time again is one of the biggest strains on uh, DC residents right now and folks who are prior DC residents or DC natives who have now been displaced. Um, and we see a, another number of um, concerns that, again, are intersectional with the climate crisis, right, um, where we know that as our conditions worsen, violence, you know, as, as the weather gets hotter, violence goes up, right, so we know that there are different examples um, that are evidence-based examples of ways that we have intersections here, um, and, and that a Green New Deal framework can help us address um, all of these um, as we go at once. Okay. So I'm going to jump into the Green New Deal for housing, but again, uh, please use the chat um, if you have a stack, a question, anything like that, so that I know, um, you know, to, to <laughs> slow down or anything like that. So I'm just going to go real quick into the Green New Deal for housing or for social housing here in D.C. I'm going to do some um, overview of what the bill does, and then I'm happy to get into any questions. Um, so the first thing to know if you're wondering what the heck is social housing, I've heard of public housing, I've heard of affordable housing, what is social housing? So social housing is really a model for um, government owned mixed income housing. And so what that means um, essentially is that there are uh, units within a property that are at different rates, including market rates and then subsidized rates. And the idea is that the market rate rent will go towards helping subsidize those affordable units. And so the, the model really is self, um, self-fulfilling and self-maintained. And so the bill um, as written, and I'm just gonna uh, get into it in a second, um, really is, is based on that framework of using the money instead of going surplus rent going into someone's pocket, it goes straight back into creating the affordable housing. Um, the other thing to note is the bill, it's a Green New Deal. So what's the climate components of it? So definitely the bill uh, is written to make sure that buildings are uh, built or retrofitted to be zero emissions. Um, they're going to be transit oriented, which means non-restrictively. It means that um, we're going to try and prioritize opportunities for building or for um, establishing these properties um, in public transit accessible areas. Um, and it's going to be, you know, we're going to make whatever adjustments need to be made and are appropriate for each property to uh, combat the climate crisis, including, for example, moving away from gas to electric because we know of the health hazards that it comes with um, having, you know, breathing gas fumes um, um, day in and day out. Um, the Another big component of it is, um, like I mentioned earlier, is a Green New Deal is an economic framework, right? It's a, in, um, injecting jobs into the um, into the economy, right? And so one thing that we have in the, the legislation is a component of um, you know union backed 
um, labor that essentially would create a uh, training program for uh, green jobs. And so, again, I'm going to get into that just now, but this is a bit of an overview of all of those things. So the three components that you have to have in your head, as I go into a little bit more detail, is social housing is a model in which the market rate rent pays for the affordable rent. Uh, there is a Green New Deal component, which is good jobs and clean jobs. And so we're going to talk about what that exactly that means in, a, in, a, in just a second. Okay, so what does the bill really itself do? And I encourage everyone, um, if you have the time, um, to just read the bill. Um, it's it's 12 pages, but it's really spaced, so it's more like, I don't know, eight, and it's not that uh, jargony on like a lot of bills that I've read. Um, so the bill itself will create a new agency in the district government called the Office of Social Housing, and that is the agency that's going to be given the permission to create and manage the portfolio for the district-owned mixed-income affordable housing. So and the developments, the market rent paying tenants will cross subsidize the deeply affordable um, um, rate tenants, like I mentioned. And then another beautiful aspect is that any um, surplus on top of that would also be used to maintain the buildings themselves and ensure that property maintenance happens on the buildings. So the affordability levels are set at extremely low income, very low, and market rate. And so what that means is that we're creating um, uh, housing at the 30 to 50% AMI, uh, that's area median income, and a third of market rate for the area. Um, so uh, this question came up yesterday of like area median income of where? And so it's of DC, it's based on the HUD schedule, the housing um, schedule. And essentially, it would be, um, you know, 30% of what the average median income is in DC is what that unit would be made of, who that unit would be made available to. So as a case in point, in DC, most Black families make 50% of the AMI. Um, and right now, affordable housing is being made available at 60 and 80% AMI, which means that we are already excluding a lot of Black families from being able to access what we call affordable housing in DC. And so this um, bill would work to lower the amounts that we are um, basically lower the AMI at which we're able to provide housing, which would include many more people. So, or which would serve many more people. Um, and then another fun, beautiful piece of this, and this is very much within the Green New Deal framework, is that where possible, the housing developments would have ground floor commercial development spaces for childcare centers, grocery stores, or small owned businesses. And so that would be able to keep community within um, the housing uh, projects themselves. Okay, so the bill uh, specifically in the law is written to have strong environmental and fair labor standards. Um, and so like I mentioned, the bill, the bill asks for these uh, buildings to be made to be net zero emissions and just feature sustainable designs. And um, a lot of these things are kind of bullet points, but it you know often says where possible or when possible, we look for these you know uh, changes to being, for example, solar dependent if power, uh, so solar dependent if possible um, and, and feature high uh, efficiency equipment on on site again to make sure that we are not just creating housing, but we're creating clean and green housing. Okay, let me just skip this one real quick. Um, a really awesome part that I love about this and that I think really makes this bill um, just, yeah, a beautiful work of social care is that the bill would create tenant leadership boards, which would essentially be responsible for adding an extra check on top of uh, whatever property management contracting is done or whatever you know work needs to be done in the building. And so what it would do is ensure that tenants still have the ability to maintain their properties, to stay on top of it and to keep them afloat. What we've seen um, in DC recently, if you've been paying attention to the news, is that a lot of the public housing has been falling apart because that tenant leadership that tenant voice is being um, is being ignored. And so this um, by law ensures that there is a coordinating council and a tenant leadership board per property to ensure and have checks and balances and make sure that we're actually keeping our properties um, in livable, um, safe and, and healthy conditions. So really awesome one for tenant power. Okay, I'll skip these because they're too in the weeds, but here's a bit of a summary um, for those of you who are like, okay, you just said a bajillion things. I'll take a pause real quick and see if there's any um, um, questions um, from any of the folks, um, especially those who, who are new today. Uh, 
I have a question. Um, is this specifically targeting an area in DC or is it like all over and there's not a like kind of guideline for where it would be? Yeah, it's all over. Um, so there's, uh, I think it's a great question about like the implementation of how it would then pan out. Um, the bill doesn't specify any particular locations. The idea is that we need to bring more affordable housing to all parts of DC um, um, and make sure that we can have that mixed income model uh, work in different places. So um, doesn't specify anywhere. But definitely if you're like, you know, I live here and I need to see more affordable housing or my family was displaced from here, that's obviously beautiful um, and really important data to bring into your testimony. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, Awad? Thanks. I had a couple questions. Um, first, what is like a, a loose timeline that that this would be implemented over in terms of like from the opening of the department of the Office of Social Housing to like day one of getting tenants in buildings? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so it's a great question, not one that I think I can answer. It's definitely not written into law. The reason I say I don't think I can answer is because We've seen before that legislation does get passed, right? So this would be the bill that would allow for these things to be constructed and for these things to come to life. And but in the past, you know, within DC government in the past few years, we've seen legislation that passes that authorizes um, a bunch of different changes. And then uh, come budget season, the budget doesn't include the money that it, it needs to be allotted for that office to come up. And so an example I can speak to is the NEAR Act that uh, was passed in 2015 that would have authorized the Office of Neighborhood and Safety Engagement, the first um, uh, violence interruption program in DC. And though it was passed in 2015, it wasn't funded in the mayor's budget until about 2019, where it started to get some money. And so it's a great question. I think it comes down to basically um, how much we can push DC government to pay attention to the bill and to implement all of its prov provisions. Does that help? <laughs> no, I was gonna say thank you so much. And my second question is, is there any incentive for DC families currently in this plan or written into this plan? Is there any incentive, what, uh, can you give me an example? Sorry, like, is there any incentive for families who are on waiting lists now or families who are trying to get into- Oh, oh, like they would get, like, would they get a, a first dibs or something like that? Right, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Any type of incentive for DC families into the social housing. Right, yeah, I don't know. I don't think the bill writes anything into a pipeline um, of like, if you're on say DCHA's waiting list for public housing or for a voucher, whether or not you get prioritized um, for some of the social housing when it becomes available. I don't think there is, but I think that's a brilliant um, addition to, to be able to add into the bill. And so, like I mentioned, and we'll get into testimony after this, you know, short Q&A um, is ways in which we can uh, formulate our testimony to speak to those things of, I look forward to seeing this included in a version of the bill. Um, I think it would be beautiful for this to happen. And so I definitely think that's a, that's a really strong suggestion. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think there's anything in it right now. Okay, and I think Clara had her hand up, perhaps, their hand up. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, thanks so much for this presentation, really appreciate it. Sure. Um, couple questions. One is um, with the tenant leadership boards, would those be elected? How is there like accountability with like the buildings? And then also, I'm curious about like the oversight of the department and making sure like there's not mismanagement, making sure that there is built in accountability also with tenants. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so the first question being, um, how would the tenant leadership boards go? So the bill again, and everyone's asking great implementation questions. And I think that, that the bill uh, the way that the bill works is really just authorizes the creation of these things and then the implementation obviously follows further so for example office of social housing comes up who's the director of that social housing office right that's a question that's obviously not going to be written an answer that's not going to be written into law of like by law this is who's going to direct that office um but it's definitely going to come into play with the implementation once that's passed and so the idea of how we solve for that you know obviously again comes down to um, making sure that our, we're pushing our voices, that it's not just um, for folks who are pushing or organizing for these things, is that we don't just just show up for the public hearing, but that we still, you know, kind of stay involved in some ways of helping um, um, envision what those offices look like. So um, 
in, quite, in terms of your first question, which is essentially who, how would these boards be created? My best guess is that it would follow a, you know, kind of common tenant union um, or tenant association process by which the um, tenant leadership is elected by the tenants of the building, um, and especially those who choose to be part of the association. Um, so if you, I'm happy to share information about uh, how uh, DC right now, how tenant unions and tenant associations can come to be. Um, if y'all don't have it, um, I'm happy to make sure that I send those in the email afterwards of like, here are the details of how your 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 building can unionize. Um, but I would assume it follows a similar process to that. Again, not written into the law, but we, you'll see that offices tend to model their work around other things that are already existing within the DC infrastructure. Um, but the um, other thing that the bill creates, right, is this um, social housing coordinating council, um, which would be at the office of social housing level. And so they would be within the, the agency, right? And so each building would have its tenant leadership order, its tenants union or tenant association um, with its elected based on the people who live in that building. And then there would also be appointed and elected um, um, folks who would be part of the council that works hand in hand with the Office of, of Social Housing to keep um, accountability for those leaderships uh, within buildings. And then also obviously oversight would be assigned to the DC council, which has oversight powers of all district agencies. So in addition to passing laws and signing on, on a DC budget, the DC council has the what are called performance oversight hearings um, and perform the function of oversight over the agencies and city district agencies themselves. Yeah, that's super helpful. I love the idea of the, the coordinating council. Um, Awada and I are actually tenant organizers at LEDC. Um, oh, awesome. So we do work with, you know, DCTU and I'm familiar with a lot of yeah. um, existing tenant associations and leadership. So I, I'd be curious like how those existing resources can already can be you know pulled into this um, yeah and then I also I had another question which was I'm curious about like the the kind of formation of this bill and this idea I understand you know I, I heard Will Maryfield talk about it and I know it comes from different places too across the world that have had have implemented this have there been already any like listening sessions or conversations with especially like public housing residents and folks who have already experienced like what it's like to to live in housing that is very different but is also like run by an agency in DC for example. Yeah um it's a good question because on the organizing level there have been a lot of different efforts led by a lot of different people right so will Mary field someone who knows about a lot about social housing has friends within the social housing public housing world and so they've been talking to folks broadly, I, I, I presume, and I've seen on like things like Instagram about, um, you know, trainings that they're hosting or meetings that they're hosting. So um, Sunrise DC is another group that pops up in terms of uh, the Green New Deal organizing and talking a lot to tenants um, throughout the past couple of years with rent control, with um, cancel rent, and, you know, now with the Green New Deal for social housing. So um, in terms of the organizing, I'm not sure. In terms of the, um, like our office, when we introduce it or any other offices that go introduce the bill, I, I'd have to guess no, um, not specifically tailored. So we visited, um, there's one public housing, um, um, this is maybe more detailed than y'all care for, but there's one public housing building in Ward 4, where Councilmember Lewis George represents. Um, and we've been there a couple of times to talk with tenants about the conditions that they're facing in those buildings and about their experiences basically living within that one building on Colorado Avenue. Um, and I know that we've talked about this then, but it's not, it's never, how do I say it? It's, and I'm sure you know this from your organizing and working with LEDC, especially in like, I know that y'all are probably doing a lot of the eviction stuff, um, the prevention stuff, but it's like, when you're worried about your housing stability right now, it's not, you're not necessarily envisioning new new ways of doing it and not necessarily trusting new ways of doing it and so on and so forth. And so I would be really excited to continue organizing in that way. And if, you know, LADC wants to partner with us, wants to partner with any of the folks in the coalition that are pushing this forward, again, because it has the Green New Deal component, because it has the housing component, you're really forcing two organizing communities to come together and work out their priorities and work out their uh, frameworks and work out their backgrounds to come together in that. And so that coalition building has been both really exciting to see and also, you know, um, um, 
slow, I guess, right, between the fact that this was introduced in April and we got a hearing in November. So we're, yeah, it's working along. And, and like I said at the beginning of like full transparency, like I am the council member, I'm council member Lewis George's organizing director, but I also am an organizer within DC's um, um, organizational spheres and, as well. And so um, I can kind of speak to that. So happy to definitely talk more offline too um, um, about how we can do that going forward. I'd love that. And especially to talk more about, you know, how to keep tenant feedback. I feel like, you know, testifying is is a great tool and also I've helped tenants testify and like it's not always tangible it doesn't always give tangible results right so I think sometimes it's not the, the go-to for for many folks to to participate so especially like more open conversations about when we get to like the implementation decisions making sure yeah. that tenants voices are heard in that too Absolutely. but definitely happy to, to keep talking and don't want to derail this too much no 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 absolutely and that's um that's where the power is, right? That's always where the power has been. And so um, 100% here to partner with that. And um, uh, oftentimes just use the council members platforms and time and ability and the fact that I have a full-time paid job to do this work, to do this work. <laughs> so, cool. Um, thank you so much. Uh, anyone else have any quick questions on the bill um, as discussed so far? Because if not, then I'll jump straight into some hot tips for testifying about the Green New Deal, the Green New Deal um, for Social Housing Toolkit, and so on and so forth. Okay, cool. Um, okay, cool. So uh, link to drop for y'all in the chat is this bit.ly, um, which is bit.ly slash dcgnd toolkit. And what you'll find in it, and let me just share my screen so that we can all follow the document along. Uh, how do I do that? Where to go? Uh, okay, there it is. Um, you'll see this uh, very cute, uh, tidy document about the Green New Deal for Housing uh, Testimony Guide. It's essentially just, if you've never testified before, you'll see some basics of testifying. And then if you're really excited to testify for this bill in particular, um, it'll include basically some explainers of the bill, um, how you can get more involved in some of the organizing or some of the learning, and then essentially um, what uh, prompts you can think about or, um, uh, uh, sorry, what's the word? Um, uh, angles that you can take in writing your testimony. And so um, what is testimony? It's essentially um, just you coming before the DC Council to share your perspective on why something should or should not happen a certain way. And so in uh, the organizing world, it is a choice to say, we're going to mass mobilize, mass recruit people to come to testify in support of a legislation. That doesn't always have to happen. It doesn't always happen, right? There's, as you can imagine, bills that get passed every single day um, that maybe you've never heard of, you know, it just becomes law. And so when we um, decide to come out and push forward for certain bills, it's because we know that there's going to be energy that's widespread, that's intersectional, that's going to reach a lot of people. And so with the Green New Deal for Social Housing, the goal is to have as many voices, especially of those with lived experiences who are impacted um, very much by the climate crisis, by the housing crisis, um, and by uh, uh, needing, you know, good, clean jobs, the economic crisis, um, to come and share their voices and perspectives, their lived experience as to what um, they want to see, why they're excited about this legislation, these models, these frameworks, and what they want to see implemented, changed, happen, what their bottom lines is, et cetera. So, how do you how do you do this thing? Um, essentially, uh, my my biggest tip to everyone is this bill. Um, this bill is a dream, right? This bill, from the fact that it writes into law tenant protections from the get go, that's amazing. That's something that DC needs, right? From the fact that it writes thirty percent affordable housing into law from the get go, that's amazing. That's what DC needs, and so. When you're testifying, there's a different reason you're probably excited about this bill. It might be the same as mine. It might be different than mine. Um, I'm from Puerto Rico, naturally. Um, I was born and raised. That's why I fought for the climate crisis is because of what happened in Hurricane Maria um, and what's happened since, right? And so for me, I come to the table 
with that climate crisis background of we need to be putting DC's money, which it has a lot of, <laughs> where its mouth is. If we're a green city, then we're actually going to make sure that the poorest folks are not having their basins flooded every two seconds, right? That we're actually um, um, creating and injecting good, clean jobs, union-backed jobs to make sure that people have a, a, a guaranteed job if you want one when you come to DC government and that we can actually make sure that the conditions of our city meet the needs of those most marginalized. So that's all to say, when you're writing testimony, think about the things about the bill that excite you, that are personal to you, personal to your family, to your friends, that are personal to the work that you do, to the organizing that you do. Um, maybe you've you know, volunteered with the mutual aid teams in DC and noticed just how much food disparity there is. And you've seen how that impacts um, everyone's mental health. You've seen how housing conditions can really impact someone's health. I had a, a, a we have a constituent services case where you know people are ending up in hospitals because there's mold in the walls, right? Because we don't have tenant leadership, because we don't have those checks and balances on property management. And so again, there's gonna be a bunch of different things about this bill. I'm just gonna go to the prompts real quick that you may find really exciting, really essential, really important and transformative. And that's what we want you to come to the table to speak on um, because you and I are different and we might be excited by very similar things, but we've obviously gotten there from different place. And so bringing your perspective into the mix is what makes us pass transformative legislation, pass legislation that empowers those who are most impacted and that centers the voice of tenants and folks who need affordable housing and so on and so forth. So. If you're convinced uh, by my trying to convince your testimony that testimony is important, then um, hopefully you'll find uh, really helpful tools here to get you started on writing your testimony or get you started on helping someone else write theirs. So I'll point out a couple of things about um, testimony that you should know is one, like I mentioned, you can sign up to give oral testimony uh, on November 22nd at 11 a.m. is when the hearing is scheduled for. What that would look like is essentially you'd be in a Zoom room very similar to this one. I'm just going to close this up real quick. You'd be in a Zoom room very similar to this one. There would be uh, panels that are arranged um, um, of about 10 people usually per panel. And you would have three minutes to deliver your testimony um, on camera, um, just orally again. Um, it's very similar to what we're doing right now. Um, if you can't show up the day of, because there is actually a date change, for the hearing, we um, got commitment from the housing committee that folks could submit their testimony pre-recorded over video. And so tenant organizers, if, if you're listening, I'll repeat that again. Folks can submit a video testimony of their pre-recorded testimony to make sure that, you know, their voices and, and um, faces that they want are delivered directly. Um, or if they're signing as well, uh, they're delivered uh, directly to the council and not just as a written paper. So if that's something that you think any folks you know or you yourself would be interested in, please you know connect with me so that we can make sure that that happens. Um, but putting the oral and video testimony aside, the other option is to submit your testimony in writing. Excuse me. <laughs> what that means is essentially sending of an email to that email I dropped earlier, housing at dccouncil.gov or .us, either one is fine. Um, uh, with your arguments or perspective as to why you think the bill should be passed. And so in the toolkit um, that I shared, I'll put it back up. Um, it gives you a little bit of a uh, outline that might be helpful um, for you to start writing. And so um, I usually tell people to start with introducing yourself. Let me know who you are. Let me know why you're here um, and then express your demands. And so what is a demand? Essentially, a demand is just you saying, here's what I need this bill to do. Here's what I need to see. Here's my bottom line. Here's what I need DC Council to do. I need DC Council to pass this legislation because we need affordable housing for our most marginalized families in the district. That's a simple demand. What do you need? What do you want? What are you asking the DC Council to do here today? Um, then you can go into why you support that. And so that's where your personal experiences and your story may come into play. And again, you can use this in whatever order you want. It's not, uh, it's not a, you can add, ad it can be like a Mad Libs. It cannot be whatever works for you. This is just something that I've always found helps get folks uh, writing if they've never done this before. Um, so again, go into that either story of self or story of friends or whatever experience <clears throat> you need to share on your perspective as to how you got here today 
to testify in support of this. And then lastly, you can always close by reiterating, reiterating your demand, remind us that you want them to vote yes for this bill or no for this bill, and that you um, look forward to working with the, with the committee on getting this legislation passed and these implementations cleared up and so on and so forth. That's really what testimony is. Doesn't take too, it's not, it's not too hard. Um, uh, one thing I've definitely become a, a serial testimony writer. And so a lot of times I'll write somewhat terrible testimony, but it makes the asks clear and it tells you why I'm here. And at the end of the day, that's all the council members need to hear and have on public uh, record in order to be able to, to amend the law appropriately. Um, so, okay, one last thing is I'll give an example just because of, I believe in optimism, I believe in good stories, I believe in success stories. Um, about a couple of weeks ago, we had um, a law passed in DC called the Local Residents um, Voting Rights Act. Uh, and essentially what it did is it expanded the right to vote for DC local elections to any DC resident, regardless of US residency status, um, which means that people who have been silenced by DC government were now being given an opportunity to vote, to speak on the budget, to speak on the things that they need to see, and to actually have you know some accountability from government on that end. When the bill was originally introduced, it actually only expanded that right to people who had a, a permanent residency or a green card. Um, and so when we went to testify this summer, hundreds of us testified, and we all just, for the most part, happened to include a very wishful thinking line that said, and we hope to see this uh, someday expanded to include everyone, right? We weren't demanding that the bill be amended to include everyone. We were saying, we, we you know, we're asking you to pass this law. And I can't wait to see a version of it someday where everyone will have the right to vote. And what ended up happening is that they ended up marking up the bill to actually expand their access to vote to everyone. And so when the bill was voted on, it wasn't voted on the original language of permanent residence. It was voted on the original on the new language of everyone. And so again, there's just like ways in which we don't, it was just really unexpected, right? Places that you don't really, you're not organizing for this to, to impact everyone. You're thinking, no, that's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. But when 106 people show up and say the same thing needs to happen, it can. Um, and in this case, it did. So again, really exciting um, for our neighbors who now have the right to vote and some of that security within DC government. And so with the Green New Deal, I know a lot of people here are tenant organizers or are working with <clears throat> hand in hand with other families who are impacted by the affordable housing crisis um, in DC. And so um, uh, I really, you know, I'm grateful for the work that you do, and I'm grateful for you um, sharing your, your perspective and the and perspective from the work that you've done with with the council on November 22nd. Okay, I'll stop talking um, because we have just about 15 minutes left, which is great. Um, it gives you the opportunity to start writing if you'd like to start writing or to ask any other questions um, while you have me here. Um, and so I'll kind of return to the. Um, uh, put the ball back in y'all's court to decide what you want to do with this time. Um, again, part of the point of this training is to create some of that space for y'all to start writing and start thinking and ask questions out loud, because um, I've found that there's some accountability that comes when we're all in, in the same space doing the same thing. So please do at this time what you want. I'll be right here. If you have any questions, please go ahead. And if not, then just let me know what I can do for you. I have a question. 